Shortly after the British Grand Prix, the government of Poland announced an end to the state of martial law that had been in place since late November 1981. The communist government had been unsuccessful in their attempts to totally suppress opposition, particularly from the Solidarity Trade Union, and an estimated 91 people had been killed in 18 months of crackdown. A refuelling error led to an Air Canada Boeing 767 suddenly running out of fuel at 41,000 feet over Manitoba. The crew successfully glided the aircraft to an emergency landing at a former airbase that had been converted to a racing circuit at Gimli, Manitoba. The pilot had actually been based there during his military service. The aircraft was dubbed the Gimli Glider and flew on until retirement in 2008. The pilot and co-pilot were disciplined by Air Canada for allowing the incident to occur, but were subsequently awarded for their airmanship in landing the aircraft. And Metallica released their first album, Kill 'Em All, the first American-made thrash metal album. The album was released in a limited pressing and wouldn't trouble the mainstream charts until Metallica saw more commercial success later in the decade, but came to be regarded as one of the most influential records in the metal genre. The Formula One teams, meanwhile, headed to the forests of West Germany under leaden skies. The Hockenheim Ring is always gloomy with its long runs through the pine trees, but when it's wet it's particularly dank and grey. The spray kicked up by the cars hangs in the forest sections, while the brutalist concrete grandstands look even more grim than usual. Work has begun on constructing a new circuit at the Nürburgring, however, which will hopefully be more suitable for modern F1 cars than the original, and many who remember the glorious old track in the Eiffel Hills and the success of the Spa-Francorchamps revival earlier this year will be hoping that Hockenheim's days of hosting the German Grand Prix are numbered. There was also news of the rest of the season, with the two US races in New York and Caesars Palace now definitely off, and replaced with the European Grand Prix at Brands Hatch in late September. The local fans at least had something to cheer for a change. The Brabham, with its BMW power, was a proven race winner, while the all-German ATS team with the same engines always looked good until it broke down. Perhaps this time they could keep it running. The only disappointment was that McLaren's long-awaited Porsche engines would have to be awaited a little longer. There was a welcome visitor in the pits, too, in the shape of Didier Peroni. First of all, welcome back to the Grand Prix scene. It's a wonderful sight to see you again. How are you? I am very well. I just had my uh, last operation uh, two months ago, and I am waiting now to have a strong right leg. And uh, I hope to, to push on the brake pedal in a two or three months. Maximum. Well, that's wonderful news. Didier, it's been a long and terrible 12 months for you. What exactly has happened in that 12 months to you? Well, I have I don't know exactly, but uh, something like 30, 30 operations and uh, 35 or 30, 37 uh, anesthesia, complete anesthesia. Now, you are here on crutches, but how, how mobile are you? Can, you? can you walk without crutches yet? No, not yet, because I can't put uh, all my weight on the right leg yet, but... Uh, it's, uh, it's coming slowly, you know, you, we just have to, to wait for uh, one or two months and uh, to walk without uh, clutches. Well, this time last year you were leading the World Championship. So many people want to see you there again. When, when do you hope to start driving again? Well, it's difficult to say. I will start when I will be ready, ready to start. But uh, one thing is sure is that if I come back, uh, I will come back with the motivation to win the World Championship. That's the, my only motivation. And uh, to win the World Championship, the World Championship, uh, I, I have to be 100% uh, of me. You know, I have uh, to, to have absolutely no problem to drive. So I will decide later if I am able to do that or not. And will that be in a Ferrari? I hope so. I would like very much. Uh, my choice is still the same. I mean, the, what I want is to, to be in the team who can offer me the most uh, chances to, to be world champion, and that is uh, still Ferrari. The weather cleared in time for Friday's warm-up sessions, when all sorts of niggling technical issues seemed to plague the teams, and by the time qualifying rolled round in the afternoon, several drivers were still kicking their heels in the garage. Johansson's Spirit, Warwick's Tolman and Winklehock's ATS were all up on proverbial bricks as the team struggled to get them ready, and the German team didn't manage to get a single lap in before the end of the day. Tempers were fraught. Elio De Angelis apparently thumped a journalist who'd been unflattering about him in a recent article, while Raoul Boesel had a nasty prang and nearly dislocated his shoulder. He was cleared to race, but would take the start with a large neck brace. On Saturday, the rain came back with a vengeance, and nobody could improve their time. Several didn't even bother trying, and Winkelhock still failed to record a time, 
so the ATS team would rather ignominiously fail to take any further part in their home race. At the sharp end, it was a Ferrari front row again, with Tombe in the top spot this time, and nobody else came close to the Scarlet cars, with third-placed Andrea de Cesaris a full second and a half off pole. Pico was fourth, the Renaults on row three, with Baldi and Patrese in seventh and eighth, and the Tolman twins making up the top ten. De Angelis was 11th, the Lotus having all sorts of technical glitches with the new 94T, Mansell could only manage 17th, and Rosberg was once again the top Atmo car in 12th alongside Johansson. Once again, Kenny Aitchison failed to do the seemingly impossible and qualified the RAM, though at least he beat Corrado Fabi, floundering nearly 12 seconds off the pace. The rain had gone again on Sunday, but things weren't getting any easier for the teams, as a bad accident in one of the support races demolished some of the catch fencing which delayed the F1 warm-up by half an hour, then the warm-up itself saw yet more mechanical gremlins plaguing almost everyone. Tombe had to revert to the old car when his brand new engine started to shake the new one apart. Prost was overheating, Mansell's engine dumped oil and water all over the track and Johansson's spirit, while De Angelis's had just stopped altogether, while the Brabham pit was covered in parts from all three cars as they tried to figure out what was wrong with them. The start should have been delayed by half an hour too, but the TV people were insistent and everyone managed to cobble together enough cars to line up on the grid. Tombe back in the old C3, PK in the spare Brabham, Mansell in the older 93T, Prost still overheating and hopping into the spare before making it to the grid, and off they went on the parade lap. With no further gremlins, the race could begin, and when the lights went green, the two Ferraris streaked away, with Tombe holding the lead from Arnoux and De Cesaris holding third from Piquet for half a lap before the Brabham got passed off camera on the way down to the second chicane. As they came back into the stadium, Tombe looked like he was going to hold back and pace himself, and the two Ferraris still had Piquet hot on their heels. De Cesaris was swamped by the Renaults on lap two, thanks to a bit of wheel banging by Cheever, while an impatient Arnoux blasted past Tombe and took the lead from his teammate as they entered the Ost curve for the third time. That was as far as Mansell went, his engine giving out, while Arnoux began to pull away from Tombe, who was fighting off Piquet. By the time they began lap four, Arnoux already had a lead of just over a second, and the leading group were beginning to spread out. Alboreto's fuel pump gave out on lap 5, and De Angelis finished off Lotus's nightmare weekend after 10 laps with another engine failure. The long straights of Hockenheim were known as engine breakers, and even the usually bulletproof Ferrari power units were suffered as Tombe lost power on lap 11 and toured in. He was sent out after an attempted fix, but to no avail. A valve had gone, and he was out. So it was Arnoux leading Piquet by some 8 seconds, chased by Prost, Chiva and Patrese, who'd now also got past De Cesaris, while a promising race for Johansson was cut short by another Honda failure. Further back, the McLarens and Williamses were having a great scrap over 9th through 12th places, and the McLaren boys were having the best of it overall. Lafitte was looking livelier than he has for some time too, getting all over the back of Robertsburg's Williams once the McLarens were through. It was absorbing rather than exciting stuff, but soon enough the race was entering the pit stop window. Both Tolmans were out with engine problems within a couple of laps of each other before half distance, and then it was Prost, the first of the front runners, into the pits. He'd broken first gear getting off the line, so he was slow away from his stop. His gearbox was already jumping out of fifth gear occasionally, and it soon broke entirely, so he only had second, third, and fourth available for the rest of the race. By lap 27, everyone except PK of the front runners had stopped, and the Brazilian led Arnoux by a hair over 12 seconds. And with most stops being 13 seconds or thereabouts, it didn't look like he'd be able to return to the race in the lead. Then, Patrese was stationary for just 9.75 seconds and it was back on again. On lap 29, Lauda overshot his pit and had to reverse back. Then the following lap, PK was in. The stop was quick, 11.12 seconds, but not quick enough, and Arnoux retook the lead. With the race now at two-thirds distance and the cars spaced out, PK was pushing hard to try and catch Arnoux, while De Cesaris was putting on a charge and had got past both Renaults to climb to fourth behind Chiva. The ailing Prost had also lost place to Patrese, and with ten laps to go it was looking like it might be quite an exciting finish. By lap 38, Piquet had the gap down to eight seconds and was taking lumps out of Arnoux's lead, while on that lap Eddie Chiva dropped out with a fuel system problem. The lead Ferrari responded to Piquet's pressure and stabilised the gap at a little over six seconds, and with four laps to go it looked pretty settled, with Arnoux leading Piquet, De Cesaris, Patrese, Prost and Lauda. Piquet was still trying hard though, perhaps too hard, as on lap 42 out of 45, flames spurted from the back of the Brabham. He parked up and hopped out and the car went up like a Roman candle. 
After last year's handbags with Salazar, PK would presumably be adding himself to the list of people who weren't big fans of Hockenheim. That late drama meant that while Arnu cruised to his second dominant win of the year, Andrea Cesaris moved up to second and Riccardo Patrese to third. Neither Italian had finished a race so far this year, and that last lap must have been a long one for both of them, but their cars held out, and the podium champagne will have tasted all the sweeter. Prost nursed his Renault home fourth, with Lauda and Watson taking fifth and sixth in the McLarens in what was expected to be their penultimate race with Ford power. Unfortunately for Nicky, though, his reversing in the pit lane earlier was deemed against the rules, and he was disqualified, which promoted Lafitte into the points. So, any disappointment Prost may have felt with his technical problems was mitigated by the fact that he'd racked up another three points, while rivals PK and Tombe had both fallen by the wayside, while Arnoux had pulled into fourth ahead of Rosberg and could still challenge in the closing stages of the season. The constructors' race remained tight, with Ferrari now easing ahead of Renault by two points, with Williams and Brabham neither looking likely to challenge for the title, tied in third. With five races to go, with five races to go, the teams packed up for the drive south, with the Austrian Grand Prix in just one week's time.